You are listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Linsenmeyer. My guest for episode 184 is guitarist Mike Baguetta, who's had 18 releases since the early aughts. You're right now hearing There Just As You Look For It, the title track from the debut release 2005 from Tin Slash Bag, that is trumpeter Chris Tyner and Mike Baguetta. They've had four releases, the most recent one being 2021. He's also released some avant-garde jazz solo stuff and four albums with the Mike Baguetta Quartet, which is definitely a jazz unit. We're going to be focusing on his more rock and roll instrumental work today. Every When We Go is the new album by Mike Baguetta, Jim Keltner, and Mike Watt. We'll talk about the title track from that. Uh, Jim Keltner is a very famous studio drummer with the Traveling Wilburys, with Rye Cooter, many other places, played on a lot of Beatles solo albums. And Mike Watt, also incredible, has been on this show before, started with the Minutemen, Firehose, very important alternative rock artist, has played with Iggy and the Stooges, etc. Then we'll go to the previous album by that trio, Wall of Flowers from 2019. We'll talk about Hospital Song. Then we'll look at another recent project. MSSV is really that same trio, but Jim Keltner didn't want to tour, and so Stephen Hodges plays drums instead. We'll talk about the song The Mystery Of from their 2020 album Main Steam Stop Valve. We'll conclude by listening to the A-side of the 2022 MSSV Meets Nels Klein EP. The song is called What's So Funny About Social Justice. For more information, please see MikeBaguetta.com. For more about this podcast, see NakedlyExaminedMusic.com. And of course, if you want to support the effort, go to Patreon.com slash NakedlyExaminedMusic. That'll get you ad-free episodes and access to my detailed episode notes. Here we go. So I will have played a little bit of There Just As You Look For It, the title track from, I guess, your debut album as... Chris Tyner and Mike Baguetta, 2005. But do you have a vast jazz guitar school repertoire before that? Or was this kind of your actual debut? Well, the first album I ever made is an album called Canto, which is a, of prepared guitar music. Oh, that is the first. Okay. That might have been 2004. There, just as you look for it, that is the first album of a group that became known as Tin Bag, which is just the duo of me and Chris. Yes, and that solo album is perhaps a little scary to start people off with because it's all that prepared guitar stuff. It's fascinating to me as somebody who went through composition school and having to listen to like, you've deprived yourself of the ability to play pitches in a recognizable way. So it has to be all based on the intensities and the, you know, but it's a little more avant-garde than what we're going to be focusing on today. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. Like, to me, when I play prepared guitar, and even now when I do preparations on guitar, I definitely don't think about it like depriving myself of something, but actually adding something that I don't have before. Sure. So yeah, the viewpoint of it is kind of interesting. But there, just as you look for it, that is uh, also prepared guitar. Just the preparations are a little more subtle, I think, than some of the stuff on Canto. What are you doing to the string? Like I know prepared piano, John Cage, whatever, going in and mm -hmm. putting paper clips on the strings and stuff, but you have fewer strings to work with on guitar. What does the preparing involve? A piece of paper weaved in? Yeah, for me, it's a variety of different things. Usually it's alligator clips, like electrician kind of those metal clips. I can put those on the string near the bridge or different parts of the string to kind of accentuate different harmonics. Or sometimes I think on there, just as you look for it, it's a combination of a couple of clips. And I have a little on that guitar, I had a little rubber band mute kind of arranged where I would put two clips on the F holes of that guitar and then string a rubber band across it. And the rubber band hits the strings right after the bridge. So you get just a little bit of muting in the way that a violin mute is kind of a piece of rubber that goes over the bridge. So it's kind of like that. It just mutes it a little bit. I think that's specifically what's on that track. Well, all that is just to say that you're coming from a avant-garde slash jazz background to get to <laughs> 18 releases later in 20 years here. Every When We Go, the new album that you've released with Jim Keltner and Mike Watt, amazing team there. The second one you recorded with that particular lineup. Can we say a few words about this project, this song before we hear it, and then we'll talk more in detail about the song. This song is kind of a first attempt, actually, of writing a song specifically for this group, which is maybe funny to think about because like you said, it is the second record. But the first record we made, Wall of Flowers, 
we had all just met for the first time in the studio the day we made that record back in uh, 2017, I think it was. That's the way jazz works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of life works like that, actually. But this second time around, I felt like, well, maybe I have a little better idea what it's like to work with them. And I can really try to write something that is specific to what I felt playing with them last time.
All right. So very subdued. You know, I guess when you're playing solo guitar stuff, there are a number of touchstones. The surf thing is going to come up. The spy, the beach thing you got here, a little more Spanish. Can you say sort of what you were, do you know what you're channeling on this? Yeah, I really don't. Those things you mentioned are interesting because yeah, the surf thing kind of has come up a lot. And I never really got that. I mean, I had gotten that from people like, oh yeah, this is a surf guitar kind of thing, but I'd never really listened to any of that music until Mm -hmm. people started telling me that. (laughs) You know, I think I was like peripherally aware just hearing it, but then I did actually start checking out a lot of sort of surf bands and and going like, oh yeah, that is a really cool vibe. And I definitely hear some of that in my sound. But you know, for this, it was just, I had an idea of a melody and I had an idea of a feeling for a song and I just kind of went with it. There wasn't really too much deeper than that. Sure. And then the guys, you know, particularly Mike Watt, who is capable of playing a full on lead bass part, clearly in this band is at least very malleable to I'm just going to basically sit on this riff and just make it all about the feel. Is that sort of what you were feeling out in figuring out how to write for these guys in particular is they're both going to do something that's they don't on all the songs, but certainly on some of these, this one and the one we're going to hear after that, Mike mostly stays on one riff throughout the whole song. This one I did write a bass part for. Mm. And so the opening riff and the opening bass line and the bass line that starts when the melody starts that changes a little bit with the chord changes, that's pretty much the way I wrote it. I maybe had a bass part written for the bridge where it kind of changes keys a little bit in the middle of the song. Mm -hmm. And I think he came up with a better bass part. So, of course, we went with that which I'm always happy to get input from the people that I'm playing with. I'm not too like married to anything specific. I always tell people that's a guide. And if you have a better idea, please do it. But I think one of the joys of playing with both of these legendary musicians is really that you don't have to worry too much about what's going to happen. It's going to be right. And it's going to feel good. And guys like that are not going to play something if it's not going to benefit the music. And was this a first take, second take? Certainly it sounds live. It might have been the first full take. I think maybe we did two takes and it might have been the second take, but I think they were pretty uh, marginally different. You know, probably just the guitar solo was different or something like that. Are you then overdubbing this acoustic part later or is that like a looping thing? Yeah, the acoustics were done separately. And in fact, they were done in a separate studio. The bulk of the record was done at Big Ego Studio out in Long Beach, California. That's where we were all together and uh, our friend Chris Schlarb produced it and it goes on on his label big ego records but i uh, actually live in gainesville florida now so uh, there's a great studio down there called pulp arts where i did the all the acoustic overdubs and keltner obviously is a, a legend among drummers for sure and it's a very entertaining part that he could play you know a pretty straight but just his feel is is wonderful but you know this sort of sounds like a first take you know that some of the particular hits are you know if you were if you're in a digital fixing mode there are things to fix But I guess the raggedness is part of the charm. Or do you you even feel that like when you're overdubbing your acoustics? Yeah, I didn't feel that at all. I don't think there's anything to fix on there. I think everything is perfect. You know, I mean, yeah, you might expect a cymbal hit to happen after the fourth measure or the eighth measure or whatever, but then you're getting something that you expect. And at that point, it kind of uh, negates the purpose of having other people play in a style that you can't define or something that you wouldn't think about. I love all the surprise that happens with playing with Jim. You know, nothing's out of place. Everything's perfect, even though it might not be what you would think. Mm -hmm. But that's why I like playing with other people. You weren't thinking Spaghetti Western, you said, with this this lead part. Do you write these things? This is a very singable part. Do you write them in your head before you go to the guitar? Or is it really with the fingers that it just comes out? Yeah, it can happen both ways. I think with this one, it was maybe bass part first, Mm -hmm. which is something I usually do a lot with the songs that I write for my band MSSV that Watt also plays bass in. A lot of times I start with the bass part and compose up from there. And I think this was kind of the same thing, especially with that first opening bass line. I think that was first. And then I I had a melody come in that I think was probably in my head. And then for me, I usually do write music with the guitar at least nearby. So I would probably have found that and then just kind of spent... This one came up pretty quick. So I probably spent a few days 
trying different melody ideas. And then it ended up kind of solidifying, you know, sometimes you can take like months or even years. I have little pieces of recordings on my phone memo recorder that I'll go back and I'll sort of transcribe over the months or years and end up putting stuff into songs. But this one came out in a few days. So luckily the melody uh, presented itself. All right. Let me try to pull out one little section. This is about 211 in So just the place where it stops with a slightly different chord. And actually, that's one of the the Keltner hits right there that I felt like, is that in time? I'm not sure. It feels good. <laughs> Any thoughts about just choreographing it so that you you know have these, are you cueing everybody to stop? Or is it just something that's working out? By the second time you play it through, they decide where they're going to, where the stops are going to be. To me, that drum hit, if you want to talk about that specifically, I mean, that's just sort of the end of a section. So he's kind of marking... Mm-hmm the end of the section before the next section. And yeah, it feels in time to me. But yeah, I definitely am not giving instructions like, okay, everybody's going to stop on beat one in this measure. Like, If you wanted to, as a musician, I think, and I know this from experience, it's really easy to over-rehearse a piece to the point where you lose the magic easily. And, and of course, without meaning to do that, I've kind of found that the stuff I really love about music is the unexpected, unnameable, magical quality of feeling. And I think the best way to try to not lose that, especially in a recording situation, is to not talk about that stuff at all. And if you don't like the way the music is coming out, it might have more to do with the people playing it, maybe aren't the right people for the song, or maybe the song isn't the right vehicle for the people playing it. I think once you get into the weeds of, okay, let's uh, hit this on the and of one here and let's make sure we stop here and make sure we change, you know, getting into all that, it's sort of unnecessary if you have the right ingredients, I think. I'm not worried about that stuff. Let's play some of the solo here. A lot of very tight, like chromatic harmony. I guess I'm playing two strings next to each other in such a way that there's only a half step between them or any thoughts about how you're putting these things together. Is it just purely instinctual? Yeah, I mean, that's a guitar sound for sure. I mean, like you're saying, just physically, you can have open strings and you can play notes that kind of ring out together. But, you know, solo is not really something I work out beforehand. I don't think I've really ever done that and it remains true for these. I think that kind of sound is something I like. I like the idea of creating a lot of tension and then sort of toying with when you're going to relieve that tension in the solo. So a lot of times I will create dissonance depending on the context and then try not to resolve it in maybe the most expected way. I like to kind of hold it a little longer than people are maybe comfortable with. (laughs) The other reason that I think it's easy for me to hold out dissonance when I'm playing a solo or something on a song like this is that it kind of remains around this one tonal center. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's kind of listening, thinking about how they might want to try to use that stuff, I think it's really easy to make dissonance hang for a really long time and kind of prolong that resolution when you have kind of a drone or a kind of one general tonal center. It makes it a lot easier to mess with the expectation of the listener for something like that. Well, and any thoughts about sort of on, uh, I guess, with a song like this, there's a limit to how crazy you want to get, right? That some of the other songs, like if they... No way. No, I I would never think about it that way. I I don't think about it in terms of this song has to sound like this Mm -hmm. or that other song has to sound like this. It's just going to be what it is. And I don't want to get in the way of it turning into something that might surprise me or someone else. So the time that we played this, that it got recorded, this is what it happened to be. If we were going to record it another time and everybody was in a different mood or it was different people or a different situation, it would have been something completely different. And that also would have been fine with me. Well, I'm guessing that sort of one post hoc edit here is to add that very long fade that it seems like, well, how much longer did this go on? Did this stop pretty much right after what we're hearing here? Or because it sounds like it, maybe you were just in that mode of, you know, we're playing mellow, we got the groove. But it's like at least 30 seconds of fade out. It's not a it's not a fast fade out. I think there was not too much longer beyond that, but I did want a long fade. 
it's a riding off into the sunset kind of thing. Yeah, okay. So a cinematic, I mean, it has that, I don't know, as soon as you start messing with the tremolo bar and you're playing a not very fast song, so it's not Jeff Beck, which some of the stuff you have has that frenetic energy to it. But this one is a much more laid back that it has that, I don't know, slightly surrealist thing. I I guess it's the David Lynch cowboy or something, if it's a cowboy. It's not... (laughs) Yeah, that's not a bad description at all. Well, let's get the second song out there so we can hear more. So this is a hospital song, including the introduction from Wall of Flowers 2019, the first album, I should say, with the same group with Jim Keltner and Mike Watt. Any thoughts before we hear it? I saw a version of you playing this solo on YouTube, and it was two minutes and 20 seconds. Whereas even neglecting the minute long intro here, the main song is five and a half minutes. Any thoughts about the development of this? When you didn't know, you you said you met these guys the day of. Yeah, this is a song that I've actually had for a really long time. And I recorded it on a much earlier record on the uh, Fresh Sound New Talent label, which might have been my first record for them called Small Spaces. And I wrote this song when I was in the hospital, trying to put the pieces together. I think in 2006, I had uh, thyroid cancer. So I had to have my thyroid removed. And I remember kind of laying in the hospital overnight after the surgery, you know, feeling pretty vulnerable and not being able to sleep and hearing all the beeps and the machines and stuff. And I remembered this melody, a piece of something that became this melody so that once I got kind of well enough to sit up with a guitar, I was able to write this melody down and turn it into a tune.
Right. So you wanted to hear that with the intro, which completely different instrumentation, just you by yourself and guitar, a little bit of overdubs. It's got that chiming. So is that looping or something? Because you're playing by yourself, but then it has these chiming additional. There's a 12 string part. Yeah. And then the song itself. So which came first, the song itself or the intro? Or is the intro just, if you had this floating around for 15 years, something, you know, at least a a decade, I assume that variations would come up. And instead of just saying, this is the one that's on the album, let's put two of them. Is that the thought here? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's a song I've played for years. So I've just played it by myself when I practice, right? I've played it with different bands and it's on that original recording, which is a a much slower Mm -hmm version and a much earlier version so it's obviously it's going to feel different but i did want to bring that to this session because i thought it was going to have a different energy with these guys and i'd been playing it sort of faster over the years than that original recording so i wanted to have a version of the way it evolved and the way i sort of play it now that i remain to play it versus that original recording but for this there is that solo part that we called intro which is uh, i played on my friend's I think it's a 1931 National Duolian Metal Body uh, Resonators. I borrowed that for the recording session. And we did a day of solo recording before doing the day of band recording for Wall of Flowers over at Big Ego Studios. Because there's a couple solo pieces on the record, right? So I think one of the things we did was just thinking ahead, like, well, if we do this on the session, it might be cool to have a solo version in case we want to use it for something. So just chronologically, yeah, that definitely happened a day earlier than the the band recording would have. Let's insert some of the previous version. Once you got in front of these amazing musicians, so you'd played with Mike Watt and other stuff before this, right? Or was this your actually meeting Mike Watt? I met Mike and uh, I met Jim and Jim met Mike all on that first day that we did the Wall of Flowers session. All right. The chronology is right. A little confusing to me just because you had then Jim not wanting to tour so that you had an equally Stephen Hodges, also a legendary drummer, doing quite a few of the things under this band name. So you have this band name. MSSV, we're going to get to massive. Just the letters. Okay. It stands for main steam stop valve. That makes sense. <laughs> you swap out one member. It has, it's a different band. Do you, is there an overlap in the set, even though it's, it's a different band? Well, the way uh, MSSV came about was that we made the wall of flowers record and the record was going to come out in early 2019. And I thought it'd be fun to play some shows. And, uh, Jim's kind of more into, uh, being at home and doing session work and stuff like that. So that's fine. And uh, I was talking to Watt and he was down to maybe still try to do some shows. So I was thinking about a way that we could do that. And it would still be fun to have a drummer play the music, but without having it really be a situation where it feels like someone is subbing for another member of a band that couldn't be there. I always feel like that's kind of a jive thing. Like, If you want to play with certain musicians, it's because they have certain things to offer. It's not because, or rather it shouldn't be because you just need a warm body behind the drum set. <laughs> you know, I feel like that's always not a great situation for anybody to be in, especially when you have, like you said, like an incredible talent, like, you know, Stephen Hodges, he's not going to be subbing for anybody. He's his own person with his own style and his own feel. But so anyways, we did want to do some shows and uh, Watt had a record come out a couple of decades ago called Contemplating the Engine Room. Mm-hmm which is his uh, first opera. And that album had a big impact on the way that I was trying to kind of devise my own music at the time. When I heard that album, it was a big light bulb moment for me in a number of ways. So in a way, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if Hodge might want to do this tour? So I got in touch with Stephen and we met up and he was down to do some shows. And so I booked this tour. It was 10 days from coast to coast. We did 10 shows in 10 days. And uh, he played drums with us. And we did a couple of songs from the Wall of Flowers record. And then we did a couple of songs from the Contemplating the Engine Room record, because uh, I think it kind of seemed appropriate. And Watts said that would be fun. 
And then we did a couple of songs that Hodges had played drums on that were also kind of influential to me in another way. And then I think maybe we added another one or two songs and that was sort of the material for the tour. So in that way, it kind of celebrates the album coming out, but it gives a different view into how the music could be played by different people. And at the same time, it kind of honors the members of this band, which is not, like you say, not going to sound like the record, but it's going to be exciting because it's something totally different. And I think halfway through the tour, we were driving somewhere and Watt kind of said in the van, he's like, what are we going to call the band for the next tour? So I said, okay, well, we got to come up with a name. So uh, Main Steam Stop Valve was one of Mike's uh, suggestions. And it ties the whole story together nicely because part of the Contemplating the Engine Room record is influenced by a book called The Sand Pebbles. Or actually, there's a movie version too with Steve McQueen. And in, in the movie version, uh, one of the main characters mentions the main steam stop valve, which is you know the crux of what keeps the uh, engine of the ship running. So it all kind of seemed to make sense for this band. Let's stop for some sponsor talk. Man, oh man, I want to tell you about Masterclass, which is an online resource that offers you hundreds of video lessons from over 150 of today's most brilliant minds available to you anytime, anywhere on iOS, Android, desktop, Apple TV, Amazon, Fire TV, and Roku. Do you want to learn about documentary filmmaking from Ken Burns? Do you want to learn to think like an FBI profiler from John Douglas? Or how to be a leader in the corporate world from Indra Nooyi, former CEO of PepsiCo? Or maybe you want to learn how to make a realistic portrait or pick a wardrobe to best express your inner being or polish up a short story or perhaps as listeners to this podcast something in music there are now two dozen music classes including a new one by john legend on songwriting i mean i would love to get john legend on this podcast i don't see it happening so why don't you dive in an annual membership costs 180 dollars per year and I want you to just compare that with like your Netflix, your HBO, because the figures, the quality of filming and editing, I mean, this stuff on Masterclass is fully up to the level of anything you're going to see in those places and will not rot your mind. You might sign up to Masterclass to hear from Metallica, Questlove, St. Vincent, Tom Morello, et al. But once you're in there, you're going to find things that any given member of your family is going to be very excited about. Masterclass is creating more and more ways to get at little bits of classes that you might not actually think to sit down and watch the whole thing. So I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a Nakedly Examined Music listener, you get 15% off the annual membership at masterclass.com slash examined. Right now, that's masterclass.com slash examined for 15% off Masterclass. Now, I'm betting you know what else I'm going to tell you about if you've ever listened to this show before. Because, yes, it is Nebbia and the Nebbia by Moen showering experience. The coolest way to get water out of your pipes and onto your body. The Nebbia by Moen Quattro with its four different spray styles. It's many different finishing options to match your bathroom it's quick and easy, easy, easy installation that even a person who is absolutely not a home fixer-upper like myself can handle with really no instruction whatsoever. So it's a shower head, innovatively designed by former Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers. It atomizes the water to heat up the environment of your shower, making it a nice, affordable way to upgrade your life experience and at the same time, it uses only about half the water that your shower probably currently does. But this is important. You will not notice. It is designed to be a high-pressure shower. You can get water out of even the thickest hair. So you might have thought that you can either have a comfortable, completely wasteful shower or some sort of environmentally conscious, miserable, dribbling experience. But no, the uh, Nebbia engineers have destroyed that false alternative and their new Nebbia by Moen Quattro is the most affordable version of this cutting-edge product yet. 
Nebbia by Mo and Quattro starts at just $119 exclusively on Nebbia.com. Nebbia gave us a special discount just for our community. Go to Nebbia.com slash N-E-M. Use N-E-M at checkout to get 10% off all Nebbia products. Again, that's Nebbia.com slash N-E-M. N-E-B-I-A dot com slash N-E-M. Check out what they have to offer. Save 10% with the code N-E-M. All right. So this is how over just a couple of years, this thing was evolving conceptually and i heard on your live album that you know mike actually sings a couple songs and you know so it's not purely a an instrumental thing back to this first thing hospital song so actually where was this in the in the scope of that day that that few days that you're recording this album was this one of the first was this hospital song i think was the very first thing we did wow and again, Mike is not playing the kinds of bass parts that he plays on Contemplating the Engine Room where he's filling up. It's a three piece. It could be like Cream, you know, in fact, yeah, it could be like Minutemen where he's filling a lot of space. I guess that's just not the vibe of this band. Did he see it like I'm doing session work for Mike's thing and I'm not getting in the way of that? Or did you even talk about that? We didn't talk about it. Okay. Because again, it, it just seems like, why would I have to talk about it with these guys? <laughs> like, again, it's not like, hey, I need a bass player for uh, this record. You know, this the whole thing was conceived around being able to try to make music with these two guys in a way that mm-hmm. was going to be maybe a little different for me and also maybe a little bit different for them and to see what we could get out of it. Like I think I mentioned before, both those guys are not going to do anything that isn't going to serve the music. So it's not really so much about trying to fill up space, but when that might be appropriate to the song or when that might be appropriate to the groove. I don't think anybody's adverse to that and nobody's trying to be safe and handle the music with kid gloves, try to not get in the way, but just to kind of find the right thing that is going to be right for the music. Mm -hmm. But you came with all these songs written in advance. Is that right? So it wasn't like... If we're talking about the Wallflowers record, Hospital Song, I wrote in advance. And that one, I didn't write a bass part. He came up with his own bass part for that. And the song Wall of Flowers I wrote, that was especially for that session. Okay. And then I think I also brought, uh, we did that old song Blue Velvet on there. I brought that with maybe maybe trying that if we had time, because that was kind of a nice song to play. And I think everything else that we did as a band, we did as part of a bunch of improvisation we did together that day. And did any of that translate to the... Obviously, it translated to the live set in that you were playing those songs later live. So you had to remember, recreate, or was a good chunk of the set like improvised on the spot when you're playing live? Well, parts of it are for sure. Mm-hmm. But the two songs on Wall of Flowers, one is called uh, I Am Not a Data Point. Mm-hmm. The other one is called Dirty Smell of Dying. And those two songs, we improvised for sort of hours in the studio together. And I went back and found pieces in that improvisation that I thought could be interesting as songs unto themselves. So I'd do a little chop and then I would transcribe maybe Watt's bass line. I would transcribe some chords that I had played. I would transcribe rhythms from what Jim was playing. And then I would take those elements that stood out to me and I would go back and I would compose different things that tried to tie it all together. And then I would overdub guitar parts, sort of like a new composition on top of that to try to make the whole thing have this feeling for the listener of not really knowing if it was composed or if it was improvised to really get it into that gray space where there's a lot of mystery happening with that. And was it whole sections, you know, the three minute section rather than I like these two measures here and this four measures here. It wasn't that kind of Frankensteining. It was some of both. Mm -hmm. There were longer sections where I would transcribe all the drum rhythms or all the guitar chords. And then there were little two bar, four bar sections of things that seemed really important to my ear. And maybe I would take those and treat them as sort of the main elements for recomposing to it. Just a little more on hospital song. So this, like the first song, has some guitar overdubs, I assume, after the fact. Let's strum an acoustic just to like make the chords. To me, it's the effect is make the chords clearer because who knows what the lead guitar is going to be doing at this point. That wouldn't have been why I did it, but I did do them after the fact. Uh, I think I just like to hear the mix of acoustic and electric instruments. I don't do it because I think something needs more like harmonic foundation or something. I feel like that's going to be there to some degree that I don't need to reinforce it. But I do like that mix of acoustic and electric instruments for sure. Sure. Well, and then the main overdub this, in fact, let me just play it. 49 seconds in.
where the main guitar has gone into this circular arpeggiation pattern. And then you've got, mm-hmm. is it just one guitar panned left and right? You know, that so with a delay, or is it two overdubs there? To get the da, da. Yeah, that little sort of sub melody line. That's a guitar on the left and then another guitar on the right. So two different tracks. So that seems essential. Like that adds a whole layer of poignancy. But was that even part of the initial conception or was that just a, I'm going to thicken this up? Yeah, it's not part of the original song. Mm. And it wasn't even in my head the day we recorded it. But when I was doing overdubs at home, I remember listening to the song and thinking like, yeah, it usually sits in that cyclical harmonic thing like you mentioned. But wouldn't it be cool if there was some other little catchy thing there? And I didn't know what it was. And it took me actually a long time to come up with that little melody line and to realize that it could happen twice and it could kind of fall into each other. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that point, it makes sense to do to do a hard pan on it. I mean, are you used to before this run of albums having a saxophone there so that, you know, if you have a second melody in your head, you can do that. You can sculpt it that way. Whereas now, okay, it has to be some post hoc thing, which clearly you can't do live. Or did you change the way you do this so that you can gesture at that riff? Yeah, exactly. I can sort of add it in live. I try not to run stereo live because it's sort of well, sure. Just an extra kludge for <laughs> for everything that to hold it up. But um, would everybody mind standing exactly in front of my amp so you could hear the two sides? The right, yes. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm the guy that I travel with one guitar and I put a high E string in my back pocket in case I break a string. I like to travel light. Believe it or not. Yeah, I've kind of reworked the way that I play it so that I can get some of that line in there if I want it, or I can hint at it, like you said, or I could just play it as part of it. Now it wasn't there before. You know, it's an interesting thing to write a song and record a song the first time you write it, like 10, 12 years ago, and then you keep playing it over that amount of time with all kinds of different groups, and the song changes enough and it evolves that you feel like, yeah, you know what, maybe I should record this again, because it feels just like a different song now, and it informs the way that you play it. You know, there's a thing I like about this song, I might keep playing it for another 10 or 20 years, and then... Who knows what might happen to it if that could warrant another recording. It could be like a totally different type of thing I do with it next time. Would some of that be that eventually you're playing this so much that eventually words just come into your head and you have to add, create a a vocal version? Maybe. Let me play a little more from uh, 4.15. So I said, we start hearing some digital stink in the overdubs. Is that just playing with the reverb while mixing or is this something that you can and do do on stage by twiddling knobs and clicking pedals? Yeah, yeah. There's some knob twiddling for sure. I do a lot of live sampling, live looping. Mm -hmm. I hesitate to use that term because it sort of means something else to a lot of people. But I like to capture bits of what I'm playing live and have them available to sort of process and spit back into the music. It's kind of an interesting concept for me, like taking a memory and putting it back into the current state of whatever you're dealing with. I like that confusion of the timeline in music, although that also does bleed into different areas of my life. But, you know, like that feeling where you you wake up from a dream and you're not sure if what you remember actually happened or if it was the dream, just that little moment where you can't really tell. I love that part in music. So one thing that I can do to help access that is to capture bits of things that have been played and reintroduce them at a later point in time. So that's what I kind of mean by live sampling, live looping. So that Mm -hmm. particular sort of high pitch thing that you're referencing in the overdub on this song, that is a little sample that comes from the cyclical sort of chord pattern. And so it's captured And then it's sort of randomized in the way that it's played back. And then in this specific case, I have it running into a Digitech uh, whammy pedal, like a pitch shifter. Mm -hmm. So I have it kind of going up in fifths and then also moving up in octaves and kind of alternating, trying to remember exactly what I did. I think I have the sampled material. I can pitch it up in an octave and then I can shift the key so they can match the different chord change because there's two different chords in that little cyclical pattern. It's a little bit to keep track of, but that's, you know, you get good at it. It's like practicing the guitar. On top of 
just seemingly having the whammy bar constantly in your hand so that you have that extra. When did you get in the habit of doing that? Do you know what your I had said Jeff Beck earlier, because that's sort of what I associate with the guitar. Even bending with my fingers is not enough flexibility. I must, you know, rip the guitar in, in half practically as I'm playing to add that extra layer of, you know, it's either that or put a slide on a finger. Yeah, I, slide is probably the more obvious choice for a lot of people. Yeah, one of the first albums that really had a big effect on me actually was the Jeff Beck record, where he is starting to play the Strat, that record called Wired from, uh, I think it's the late 70s. Yeah, that was a huge record for me. It was in my dad's record collection. And that was the one I would always kind of pick out and wore out over the years. And specifically because he played, this is kind of how I got into jazz as much as I got into it or was able to get into it. He plays a version of Charles Mingus's Goodbye Pork Pie Hat on that record. And I didn't know anything about anything, but I love listening to that track on that record and the way he plays it. And I remember looking at the liner notes on the back of the record and sort of realizing like, oh, he didn't write this song, but he recorded it. And so to like my young mind, that was really interesting. Like, oh, you don't have to write your own songs to record them. Okay, interesting. Well, who is this Charles Mingus character? So I think I went out and sort of started to learn about who he was, or maybe I got a Mingus record. And that was kind of how I got interested in jazz music, sort of working backwards through liner notes on records, finding just following things that were cool with my ear, you know. And so I was aware of like that style with the whammy bar and things, but I never really thought it was for me until I started hearing uh, another guitarist named David Torn. Oh, yeah. The way that he's able to really give a very human sound to the instrument, as well as all kinds of other unknown creature (laughs) sounds to the guitar. You know, I think a lot of it had to do with the way he can manipulate the, the bar and sort of make the notes move in the way that a voice would move. So the way he used it really started to speak to me where I started thinking like, you know, there could be something for me in this. And of course, you don't want to mimic things exactly, but I had a feeling that there was something for me in my voice and on the instrument and in music that had something to do with that from hearing the way that he could do it. And so that was really when I started to kind of investigate that. He He's such a big help to me. He's like so generous with his knowledge. And I got to play on his last uh, ECM record called Son of Goldfinger, he added a couple of guitars to the string section on one of those pieces on there. So I got to really work with him on that music. And uh, so it was really cool to be on a record with someone you've kind of looked up to from afar and uh, on your instrument for decades, you know. But he told me all kinds of really interesting things that you can do at the Whammy Bar and stuff that I still continue to practice daily. Well, and I wanted to ask you, I mean, having those sort of connections, how to navigate, it seems like it used to be that Rock and jazz were just separate things. But somebody like David Torn, who's done so much session work, and that you can have the jazz background, the jazz chops, but still be welcomed on that, I don't know, whatever things that Brian Eno has produced (laughs) or the things that are influenced by that, this British influenced, I mean, that's not what you're doing. This is a very American sounding record now, but it's still, did Tin Bag just play jazz venues or how how do you even market yourself when you're starting an instrumental group here you know i never really worried about it that much maybe i should have (laughs) people don't really know what to do sometimes when they don't know what to call something but for me it was never really a concern because i love all kinds of music and i never really thought that i had to choose you know like are you a are you a mets fan or are you a yankees fan because you can't be both (laughs) that never really seemed like a music thing to me like yeah of course i love Jeff Beck, and I love Miles Davis, and I love Dinosaur Jr., and I love Shostakovich, and I love King Sonny Ade, and I love James Brown. And, you know, like, why do you have to only do this? And of course, I'm not like naive. Like, yeah, I understand that genre helps people define things for lots of reasons, but I just want to see how long I can stay away from that. I actually use a term called post genre because I feel like in 2022, it's sort of pointless to be having those little minutiae discussions anymore. Because like you say, it's, there's a whole history of music of things mixing. Why do we keep trying to separate it? It was more just like, are you playing jazz festivals or who, who's on the bill with you? Who will book you? It seems like those things are defined less by musical style than by networks of musicians. But now we have David Torn and folks like that who seems to have... Actually, last time he played in my town in Madison... It was like at a university arts building. It was not It was not at a bar that Mike Watts band of the day could have been opening for them or whatever. 
It was some, this is art music. I don't know. I guess that's the way whoever was booking that tour decided to look at it. And I guess if your songs are all, if I'm remembering that album correctly, I was, I think I was in talks to maybe have him on the show at that point, but all the songs were 15 minutes plus. It was a little difficult to put, you know, I'd still love to talk to him sometime. But yeah, anything to relate in terms of when you say you don't worry about that, is that just because someone else is booking the tours or are you a very DIY musician in terms of the business? Yeah, I'm usually booking the tours for sure. But I mean, I've booked things at art type performance spaces as well as rock clubs, as well as different types of music festivals. I'm not worried about it. So I want to try to see if I can make everyone else not worry about it. Sure. I'm not too picky. If there's an environment that's willing to let the music happen and expose people to it that might not normally be exposed to it, I'm like even way more for it. You know, if you put art music in a rock club or if you put rock music in an art space, let's do it. Yeah, I guess it's just a matter of how high they have you cranked in the PA. Or it makes the people sort of think differently about what they might have expected. Mm -hmm. You know, well, let's get the third song out there. I'm taking so long getting distracted by it, but we've already talked about MMSV. So the mystery of which this is a much less straightforwardly audience friendly thing. I mean, it's got a, it's got a sort of a warped spy surf sort of thing, a lounge gesture. You know, it's still very melodic, but especially this opening, I wrote jingle bells from hell prepared guitar. So <laughs> what you're doing, can you prepare folks for what they're about to hear from this mainstream stop valve? This is 2020. So in between the two things we've heard. The opening is actually just me strumming the strings above the guitar nut up near the tuning pegs. So they're real high. So I'm just strumming that. No preparation necessary. It's right there. No preparation, <laughs> just other than stabbing your finger and bleeding all over the strings sometimes.
similar drum approach, even though this is Stephen Hodges, straight ahead, but very beefy sound. Did Mike Watt write this? Was this a jam? No, this is a full composition. And in fact, this is one of the first songs where I started kind of really getting into the way that I write music for MSSV, which is starting with the bass part. Hmm. This is an idea that Watt had brought up uh, at some point on one of our little previous tours. We get to talk a lot when we're on the road, just talking about whatever, listen to a lot of music. And I think one of the conversations was like, how come often people write the bass part and then it's just maybe kind of a little throwaway thing and then they really want to get to writing the melody over it? What happens if you start with the bass part? What happens if you start with a bass line as a foundation and you compose the rest of the song influenced by what the bass is doing, right? Kind of a deeper thought than just have a good bass line and then get the melody going over it, right? So I kind of thought that was really interesting. And I like the idea of writing music specifically for the people that you're going to play it with, you know, which is not an original idea. I mean, at least Duke Ellington, at least back in the 20s and 30s was talking about that. And I'm sure plenty of people before that have had that idea. Ideally, the people you want to play with have that individualistic sound, that individual voice that they can add to something. So why wouldn't you take advantage of that? And so in my case, Watts there with his very identifiable bass sound that I've been listening to in all kinds of different records and bands over my lifetime is just a listening human. So there's a sound and a feeling when I think about his sound and I get the opportunity to write music around that. I'd be kind of foolish not to experiment with that. So this is one of the first songs where the first thing I did was try to come up with an interesting bass line that I could imagine sounding really fun for him to play and kind of maybe influenced by things in my ear that he's played before, but then also using that as a stepping stone to write the composition based around that part. I mean, a lot of the reasons the, the bass part comes later, or uh, if you've got a very identifiable chord. It seems like what he's playing is harmonically ambiguous in a way that really gives you a lot of freedom. You know, if you're playing in a three piece, if you don't have to worry about the keyboardist next to you, that's also trying to figure out how to fit in with this. I guess then you get something more like the bitches brew or something like that, you know, but having just the guitar that you can take this any sort of direction. Actually, this was the one. In fact, let me play about 137 in where I wrote underlying strumming on acoustic to clarify the chords. I mean, I guess at that part of it, the bass is doing something that's much more harmonically definite, like we're supporting it. So it's more just makes it sound juicier and thicker to have the acoustic there rather than just this very bent. I could see playing that very straight or doing it on trumpet or something like that. If you're going to have that amount of tremolo in there, having something to stabilize at least makes it sound sweeter, whether it was necessary or not. It would have felt different if it was there. It would have felt different if it wasn't there. You're not saying it's a better or worse thing, but that's also just not how I would have thought about it. It just sort of, that might have even been a Chris Schlarb suggestion in the studio, like, hey, how do you feel about hitting the chord here once in a while? And I think it actually, there's another part in the song that comes next before the guitar solo where there's these little, imagine them as little twinkling stars of notes panned left and right that are actually on the acoustic guitar. So I think putting the acoustic in that part of the song just sort of foreshadows that it's going to play a role texturally coming up. Let me play a little of solo here. So I think that's exactly the part you were talking about with those spooky acoustic things pan hard left and right. But right. it still gets to be harmonically ambiguous because, you know, that is a very, actually I wrote, it sort of had a Koto feel, you know, the Japanese instrument. Like, is that just one of the tricks that comes out of your bag periodically? Or was this sort of unique to this song that you're trying to write, a, you know, make your guitar into a whole different instrument with every song? I wanted that sound on this solo because it is kind of a, mysterious mm -hmm. sounding set of harmony, maybe hence the name of the song. I don't know. The name came later, I assume. All the names come later, except for hospital song, because I wrote it in the hospital and like 
you know, for a moment, I thought every song I wrote would be like that. I think the original name for this was Mystery Song. And then I had another song called Flower Song, which was Wall of Flowers. And then I had Something Something Song, like I, you know, the totally non inventive naming scheme. So the full titles usually come later. But, anyways, that sound is uh, actually not Whammy Bar. That is a slide on there, but it's a. Uh, oh, okay. But it's not a normal guitar slide. It's and it's actually gone now. But it was a little, it's this cheap little thin piece of plastic that was kind of like the inside of a like a roll of bubble wrap or something. It, it wasn't because I bought more and they had cardboard tombs inside them. I was trying to find another one, but I I still have no idea where I got it. But it was a really, it just was like a cheap thin piece of trash basically. But I would wrap it around my finger and play as a slide because it had like almost no sustain like you can hear Mm -hmm. and it has this really weird sound like a very kind of staccato thin sound but there was something kind of really attractive to that sound because it's you know you kind of don't know what's making that sound it doesn't really sound like guitar it kind of is slide but it has this other thing going on and i love that sound and so i was going to use it on the big mssv tour we did this past spring the the haru tour and uh, that was 48 shows it was kind of the record release tour for this record also that this song comes off of. And so I had that slide, that exact little cheap piece of trashy plastic, would play it on this song for the first night. And then I'd kind of throw it off to play the rest of the song when it was over. And after that first gig, first night of the tour, the sound man, he comes up to me after the gig and he, he's holding all this plastic in his hand and he goes, I'm so sorry. I think I just stepped on this. So that was the end of that, you know, and then I was kind of, you can kind of get the sound from like the tip of a Sharpie marker. You can kind of get the sound from, uh, you know, a little inner tube of something. Basically, I just needed to find like a little piece of plastic trash every day to use after that. So going on into this solo, let me play about 332 in. Where it just becomes like an extended chord, but like you're adding extra notes and you're mo- I mean, I haven't actually seen you play this one live with your hand. Are you moving up the fretboard or are you just adding on a finger here and there just to kind of have some movement, but it still has, you know, the driving as if you're just playing one chord the whole thing? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of an example of something that's going to change every night because that's sort of, you know, the quote unquote solo section. But, you know, in that particular case like on the recording i'm probably doing a combination of both in my mind i'm thinking like oh i want to keep building up the tension probably both through texturally how i'm strumming if that kind of becomes more unhinged or also do i want the notes to go higher and is that going to create more tension i might be moving up like in inversions up the neck or adding notes to the original chord shape it could be any of those this is why I said in the first song, like there were limits for how crazy it was going to go. By contrast to this song, where you start with this thing that sounds like it's going to be a soundtrack to uh, people having a hard time in a mental institution or something, and then there's no limit in terms of just how big this can get, how frantic you can get, other than you know just the limit of that you're keeping some sort of jazz ethic more or less in the arrangement. You're not going to have the psychedelic strings come on top of that or so i don't know have you played around with more extensive arrangements or studio you know just so you could you know what you're saying in terms of adding those overdubs in the in the hospital song to like oh wouldn't that be nice to add that little yearning bit and have some i would think at some point if you record enough of these albums that (laughs) or is that just against your your musical religion to uh I'm going to get strings in here. I'm going to overdub my guitar 12 times. I'm going to, you know, really be able to add extra dimensions. It's hard to say. I think the song tells you what to do at a certain point when you're thinking about how you might want it to sound. I still really don't think about that type of thing like, oh, it's this song, so I can't do this. Sure. sure. I don't ever think about it that way. I think like you can do anything with any song. It's easier to talk like that after you've heard a recording of a song. And I wouldn't want to think that way before it's been recorded. So if I'm thinking about it on that side of it and someone else hears it later, it's easier to think about on that other side of it because you hear the, you know, the quote unquote completed thing and then it has that feeling. But when you're making it, I don't know what that feeling is yet. And I don't want to pre prescribe too much of what I think it should be at that point. So it gets recorded and certain things happen and then the shape kind of takes shape and. 
And yeah, you have tracks that can set a direction to it, but you can still change that direction if you wanted to. Anyways, a long-winded explanation, but I don't think there is any uh, limit to what I could do with the song. And, you know, if I'm going to add psychedelic string burnout or 12 guitar overdubs, I mean, all that sounds totally reasonable to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a certain elegance to staying more or less in the jazz idiom of this is people on stage. And yes, I can sweeten it a little bit because it's a studio thing. But for the most part, like I want to be able to, you know, you want to be able to take this back on the road and have it still sound like this is not repeatable. <laughs> well, I also like the idea that you'd make a record and then you would do it live with a different sound. With a different band that it's almost like you're being a cover band of your own music. I've heard some uh, somebody I had on here. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking. In of a derogatory way of like, oh, I don't know. I felt like <laughs> I was being a cover band of it. But th- that's kind of a cool thing. You know, I like the, the yeah, for sure. The police that they would specifically say like, what we do in the studio is what we do in the studio. Once we get out there, like it's a different thing. It doesn't even matter if it's the same people there. (laughs) We're still going to have a totally different interpretation. It's a good reason to go to the gig too. Like, wow, this is going to be really different than the record. I definitely have to hear how this is going to be different. You know, that's real attractive to me. And it can't be an accident that again, that's like Andy Summers, really a jazz guy. stuffed in this rock box but it opens certain doors it's not like uh the cars another one of my favorite bands but like it's always going to sound pretty much exactly like that (laughs) yeah and there's a lot of things that you can get from all those types of things you know like we were talking about earlier with the genre kind of cross-pollination of genre or whatever like Mm -hmm. yeah there is that sort of jazz with a capital j thing about music about like kind of embracing the improvisation, the differences every night, maybe the live performance aspect. But those things exist in rock music. I mean, those things exist in all kinds of musics, maybe not the improvisation so much like in earlier century classical music. Okay, yeah, that's pretty specific. But if you go back even further, you know, Bach was improvising those organ pieces that then were committed to paper that get played as compositions, you know? So I think it's not so easy to think about it that way. I don't know. Well, let's wrap up (laughs) by introducing a final thing, yet another. So this is MMSV meets Nels Klein. The song was What's So Funny About Social Justice, which I'm hearing at least three guitars here. (laughs) There's a swirly thing. There's the sort of the main lead line. And then it seems like Nels takes a solo later. You know, as far as I could tell, I've had him on the show before, so I'm pretty familiar with his style. Can you tell beforehand who, who is who? Tell the audience. Yeah, there is uh, some sort of like guitar sampling, looping kind of sounds. I think that's both of us doing different types of things. Okay. And then I'm playing kind of the more chordal riff stuff in this song, and he's playing the more melodic type of stuff. And he is the one taking the guitar solo for sure, too. All right. Any other words uh, before we go about... This meetup, was Nels on your radar for, I know he's played with Mike in a band that I interviewed Mike Watt about, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, Nels is like a big influence and and also just like another super friendly, generous dude to little old me. But I forget when I first heard him, it was definitely a long time ago, and it was definitely like in more improvised music settings. But then, again, back to Watt's contemplating the Engine Room record, he's the guitarist on that record. and. You know, that record had a huge influence on me, not even so much for the playing, but just the concept of this idea about how you could have music that wasn't really defined by a certain genre, but also didn't really impact the sound of the band. That album, it sounds like a band that is not limiting themselves to any specific style. And yet you can hear that they pull from everything, but they still sound like a very specific set of voices making really individualistic music. That was the big thing about that record for me. Uh, But so Nels was on there, of course. And so since that was the record that made me think, oh, I should ask Hodges if he wants to play with me and what in this band I'm making. And so when, you know, disease hit and we're all in lockdown, I was talking with Watt and Hodges and we decided we'd try to do a bunch of seven inch releases where we'd record our parts separately and see how it worked out. So we started working with that. I was writing new music for us. And I would make these little demos of just, you know, ideas. They could use them or they could not use them for their parts, making a click track, writing the songs and sending it out. And then we'd see like, oh, maybe 
is uh, somebody that would be cool to play with. Uh, so we asked Nels if he'd want to do a seven inch with us. And in this case, MSSV meets Nels Klein that uh, Striped Light Records out of Knoxville put out this song. What's so funny about social justice? This is my composition that I wrote for the four of us. And the other side is uh, Nels's composition called Loose Stone Fresh Oil that he wrote for the four of us. So we each wrote one song to go on each side with all four of us playing together in mind. So it was kind of a fun way to work. And we recorded all our parts separately in our little home spaces. And we sort of sent it around with people adding their parts and sending it back to add other parts and then sending it out to get mixed and pressed and all that. So it was a good positive way to kind of use that time to still continue making new stuff. Well, that's great. I, I'm going to have to fish around to see who else, you know, in the more straightforwardly jazz community, it seems against the jazz religion to do stuff in separate, in overdubs, in different studios, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know that Herbie Hancock would have done something like this, but maybe somebody a generation or two younger that are open to this kind of thing. Well, you know, <laughs> I would just say quickly, I think Herbie is probably a lot more forward thinking than, That's true. <laughs> than musicians a third of his age. So I don't know about that example in particular. <laughs> sure. He wrote Rocket. I mean, yeah, of course. Exactly. Of course, yeah, exactly. Some flexibility. All right. Well, anyway, here we go. What's so funny about social justice? Thank you so much for doing this. It was a, a pleasure listening to all, through all your stuff. Thank you, Mark.
Thanks so much to Mike. Pleasure to talk to him. Another guy who, even though he claims he does everything by feel, that he doesn't think about these things, still had quite a lot to say about these songs. You can learn more about him at mikeabagetta.com. The blog post accompanying this at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com includes links to some live performances, even some of these very performances we listened to by Mike, Mike, and Jim were, I think, captured on video in the studio, so you can actually see them emitting some of the noises you just heard. And if you want to hear more of Mike's more overtly earlier jazz work or his Tin Bag albums, I've got links to some of that material there. And if you're hearing this on the Partially Examined Life feed or somewhere else, I want to make sure that you are subscribed directly to the Nakedly Examined Music feed. Go to nakedlyexaminedmusic.com and look for the various links, or just look up the podcast on the streaming platform of your choice. Now, on Spotify, we actually just bundle all the Partially Examined Life Network episodes together on one feed. However, if you're a Spotify user, there is a playlist for Nakedly Examined Music songs. So if you want to know what I'm going to be covering on the episodes I'm prepping for. If you want to have all the songs covered on every episode I've ever done in one linear list, then go search for Nakedly Examined Music on Spotify. But of course, Spotify does not pay the artists very much at all. So I encourage you also to just go to Bandcamp, say, or wherever you would normally buy music in digital form and throw a few dollars at Mike or any of the other artists that I cover. And while your purse is open in such a way, I want to remind you that uh, patreon.com slash nakedly examined music is a place where they would be most appreciated. Even a very small per episode donation shows that this is a project you want to see keep happening, which is not a foregone conclusion. So with inflation, your mere dollar, say, per episode is worth almost nothing, but it would be a signal to me that you are on board. So patreon.com slash nakedly examined music thank you to those who are already supporters including currently ethan christopher matt bernard mark david ismail and all the others that have provided support over the years it is all very much appreciated in other news if you look me up as uh, mark lint l-i-n-t on the various streaming services more and more of my archived albums are coming out on those and I've been adding to the Mark Lint music playlist as well. And interestingly, Spotify, I think, just added the ability for me to reorder such playlists. So it is not merely the order in which songs were added to the playlist, but I get to create a little mix of my own tunes, which is fun. Hope things are going well for you, that you're being creative, expanding your musical imagination through learning about cool artists like Mike. But however you do it, keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Linsenmeyer signing off.